tunnels only recognize a stockpool of students. Um, but there are quite a few people who who are not students or who not from I don't think there's a mayor school. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually one of my doctoral students. You may know him, Zach Burst. Fantastic. I just haven't seen him all semester. <laughs> so it's kinda Yes. I know he's alive and kicking and being productive, so that's good. Trish, do you want to give me a thumbs up or when to start? Or to yeah, no, this is fantastic. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for joining us on this very snowy evening. Uh, and welcome to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. My name is Bridget Terry Long, and I'm the Xander Professor of Education, as well as the Academic Dean here at HGSE. And I'm going to start by introducing Peter Bull. Peter is the Vice Provost for Advances in Learning and the Charles H. Carswell Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations. In sep September 2013, he was named as Vice Provost responsible for Harvard X, the Harvard Initiative in Learning and Teaching, and research pertaining to Harvard X. Together with William Kirby, he teaches China X, uh, one of the Harvard X courses. Peter's research is centered on the history of China's cultural elites at the national and local levels from the 7th to the 17th century. In addition to his work with Harvard X, Peter also led Harvard's university-wide effort to establish uh, support for geospatial analysis and teaching and research. And in 2005, he was named the first director of the Center for Geographic Analysis. He also directs the China Historical Geographic Information Systems Project, a collaboration between Harvard and Fudan University in Shanghai, to create a GIS for 2,000 years of Chinese history. And I now welcome Peter to introduce Justin. Thank, Thank you. you. So today we're going to be getting a report from, um, from Justin Reich. And we have two discussants, uh, Dean Long and Dan Levy, who's the co-chair with Andrew Ho of the Research Committee for Harvard X. Um, and I should acknowledge that we have, with Andrew Ho who's sitting there, and Ike Duong from MIT, they have until this moment really led the, the research teams at Harvard and MIT, which have worked very closely together on data. No, so Harvard X is all about MOOCs. Uh, massive open online courses, and they have been massive. Um, but I think it's not just only about that. And we've one of the things we've been interested in is what happens, for example, when we take the learning elements that are created for online courses using new technology and bring them in to change the way teaching takes place at Harvard with the so-called inverted classroom or flipped classroom. Uh, there's lots more I can say. I'm actually going to try to finish quickly because I suspect that um, the snow will deepen and many of us will want to get home. And so we're really impressed by everyone coming here. We have seats, by the way, in the middle here. So please, uh, do it now before Justin begins, right? I don't mind being interrupted. Let me, let me bring up the question of why we are doing Harvard X. You know that MIT and Harvard made significant investments in uh, creating the uh, edX, a company to build a platform to make massive open online courses possible. And as if I ask around to try to understand why we did that, it's not every day that two universities uh, make such a, a shared investment of, of such magnitude and continue to fund it. Harvard this year will be putting up 40 courses, and we plan to do 20 courses a semester for the next several years. Um, th this is a major, major undertake undertaking by the university. So if we ask why we're doing it, we really find that there are three reasons. And, and different people will er, give these three reasons in different rank orders. Right? One is that Harvard and MIT need to learn how to compete in this space. Last year, it's 
it's said, and, and the, the, the figures are hard to come by, that 7 million students took at least one online course, a third of American students. Most online courses, as you know, are for credit, and they charge. Uh, online courses last year were a $25 billion industry. And there is a notion of disruptive technologies that rise very at the, sort of at the bottom and then eventually rise up. And before you know it, people at the high end find themselves not able to compete very well. So some people will tell you the reason we're doing Harvard X is because we le need to learn how to compete. There's another group of people who say, no, the most important reason we're doing Harvard X is because we actually have as a university a responsibility towards our civilization and towards the world. Now, you'll hear more about how we're reaching the world from Justin's talk today and their analysis of the data. But that clearly is a, is a reason that for many people is very important. Seventy percent of the people who are taking 70 percent uh, Harvard, uh, Harvard X courses are outside the United States. We're reaching people across the world. Now, we have an obligation, one could argue, to those people. The nature of that obligation is something we need to talk about, and I don't want to say too much about the data you're going to hear, because actually the data you'll hear about today was going to help us understand how we reach that public and what kind of public it is. And then there's a third reason for why we're doing Harvard X, and that's to improve the way we learn and we teach here at Harvard, but generally. And in order to improve the way we learn and we teach, we need research. And that's exactly what the research committee for Harvard X has been doing. Doing the research that lets us understand, ask the questions that we think are going to guide us along the road. And this is, a, this is going to be a multi-year project. We've only begun to get data now. I mean, it's not the kind of in-depth data we want. There isn't going to be, there isn't A-B testing yet and things like this. But down the road, we are going to be using this data and we're going to reach understandings of what it means, right, to teach in a better way and better ways of learning. And that's why we're having this meeting tonight so that Justin could tell us what we've found out so far. So, Justin Wright. Uh, thanks so much, everyone, for making it out here on a very snowy night. Uh, I'm very grateful for you for being here. Um, and uh, the reason we're here today is that uh, between the Harvard X and MIT X research committees, we launched uh, 16 uh, reports today, 16 working papers and uh, course reports. And I hope that you see this talk as sort of an invitation, um, a little bit of an introduction to this work and an invitation to continue reading and, and learn more on your own. Um, one of our papers was a synthesis paper um, that looks at all 17 courses that were launched on the Harvard X and MIT X platform in the 2012-2013 academic year. Um, so we have a synthesis across the reports, but we also made considerable efforts to drill down into many of the courses that we launched last year. Um, MIT X uh, released today 11 reports, one for each of the courses uh, that they ran last year. We launched four reports today. Um, we worked very closely, a team that I'll talk about in a minute, on all of these reports. I was the lead author of three of them. Um, one of them is a course report that looks at the first two courses from the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, another one looks at Justice, and another one looks at Heroes X. Um, these reports combine the statistical analyses of all the log data and database table data that comes out of um, the edX platform with interviews with course faculty, interviews with the uh, course developers, with a close reading of the materials, trying very hard to take the data that we have from these platforms and put them in the context of the learning experiences that faculty were trying to create. And then we're very fortunate that Terry Fisher of the Berkman Center, who taught Copyright X, was willing to kind of re-release uh, his uh, working paper about the experience he had developing, teaching, and analyzing his course. Um, so there's an awful lot to share today, and this will only sort of scratch the surface of it, but I hope it's an invitation to read more. Um, 
I'm incredibly fortunate to work with a very, very talented uh, and very, very fun group of colleagues to work with, um, led on the Harvard X side by Andrew Ho, uh, led on the MIT X side by Ike Chuang, who are both here, and very grateful for that. Um, my postdoctoral fellow colleagues, Sergi Nesterko um, and Daniel Seaton, who each, each of whom could have equally well given this talk as I could have. Um, Jeff Emanuel is on the Heroes X team and helped with that report. Um, Tommy Mullaney is an undergraduate from the college who is instrumental in helping us put the, the data together, and so is Jim Waldo, um, who's the CTO of the university, who is very involved in this project. Um, it's then humbling, actually, to think about all of the people across the university and across both universities who've supported this work. And I'm sure I've left people out, but I tried to list a bunch of them. Um, the MIT Office of Digital Learning, led by Sanjay Sarma, the leadership of the Harvard X team. Um, there's a group of folks at edX on the analytics team, and Rob Rudin is here from engineering, who have been incredible at getting the data towards us. And we're grateful to um, Olga and others who I've seen who are here who are helping with that. Um, the Institute for Quantitative Social Sciences uh, main maintains our servers and keeps our data stores and makes sure we can get access to stuff. The communications team uh, helped us produce the reports and publicize them and make them beautiful. The course teams were instrumental in sharing um, their insights with us and helping us make sense of the data that we were finding. There's a 14-person Harvard X Research Committee, um, scholars all across the different schools and different de departments of the university who've advised us in, and shaped this work. It's really quite humbling to think about all of the people who have come together for what really is a university-wide effort um, to try to understand what we can learn from these different learning environments and in fact across university effort because it's been so fun to collaborate so closely um, with the folks from MIT. Before I get specifically into the sort of data and findings from the course, I want to editorialize a bit. And some of the things that I would say, particularly the figures, are sort of um, shared positions from all of us. And there'll be a few things that um, my colleagues may or may not agree with me on. But uh, here's sort of me offering a little bit of a tour of where I see the state of, uh, of MOOC research now, just that, just not just at Harvard X, um, but across all different kinds of places. And Peter Bull, I think, alluded to this a little bit in terms of what kind of research we're doing now and what we might be able to do in the future. Um, a lot of the first round, the first year's worth of MOOC research reporting, um, you, you might be able to describe as fishing in the exhaust. So computer scientists um, use exhaust as a metaphor for the sort of data that's emitted from a platform as it's running. Um, and we as researchers kind of cast our lines in there. Um, the research plan looks something like, let's have a bunch of faculty run a whole bunch of courses, and let's scoop up all the data afterwards and see what we can find in there, see what sort of interesting correlations and patterns and observations that we can find, which is a fabulous place to start. It's a very sort of hopeful approach. It's an approach that, that doesn't have as much design as some of the other ways that we could be tackling these problems and will be tackling these problems in the future. Um, I think in the next year, for instance, we'll see a lot more different kinds of experimental research that's done. There was some that was done in the first year. There'll be much more. Um, many of the early experiments that you'll see um, are going to take place in the periphery of courses. Um, they're going to take place outside of the instructional core. Um, here's an example of what I mean. So if you recently registered for a Harvard X course um, and took a registration survey, about half of you were assigned a question which said something like, how committed are you to completing this course? Um, and another random half of you were asked a question which went something like, um, people who are committed to completing courses are much more likely to actually finish them. How committed are you to completing this course? So a little randomly assigned nudge, a little randomly assigned prime. Um, the kind of experiment that you can run regardless of what kind of course um, you're offering. It could be a poetry course. It could be a science and cooking course. It could be anything. Um, it doesn't require the involvement of the most precious resource that we have in course development, which is faculty time. Um, so these are kinds of experiments that are really interesting to run, but don't really get at the instructional core of the pedagogy of the particular course. Um, I'm really interested and enthusiastic for more people to start exploring qualitative, um, anthropological approaches to researching these learning environments. I think one of the, one of the experiences that I've had um, over the last six months looking at this data is that you're often wondering how people make meaning of the experiences that we see through the clickstream data. Um, what kinds of things are they doing that we can't see? What are they doing on their computers that's not being picked up by the, by the platform? What other, pro what other software programs are they using? What other websites are they visiting? Who are they talking to? Do they have notebooks? Are they scratching down notes that we can't see? Um, how are they making meaning of their learning experiences? What does this mean to them? Um, there's lots of room and lots of opportunities uh, to do observational research, um, to, to do observations in the field to help us better understand and better contextualize the data we're getting. 
And then I think 30 years of education technology and learning sciences research suggests that the most powerful research that we'll be able to do will involve close partnerships between software developers, uh, between educational researchers, between course faculty that really get into design research at the pedagogical core of any course. We'll ask questions like, what are the learning objectives that you most care about? What's your theory of change here? What parts of your pedagogy are most important to you? And then how can we start designing and iterating and experimenting around that? Um, I was just at Coursera the other day and uh, was talking with some of their engineers and researchers who were saying that sort of three years into this process, there are now people who are starting to come back to them saying, you know, I've run my course one time, two times, three times. Now I'm really ready to try some new things. I sort of have, I have my feet underneath me. Um, I'm excited to do more. Um, there are lots of different approaches um, to doing MOOC research. I think you'll find in reading the reports that most of the, the work that we're reporting on kind of falls um, in this first category of learning analytics or big data or fishing in the exhaust. And I think that's great. That's exactly where we should be right now. Um, what I'm hopeful for is that in two years and three years and however long it takes, um, Further research will reflect more of these different approaches. Um, hopefully one of the things that we can do in this first round re of reports is motivate interesting experiments, point people, point qualitative re researchers, anthropologists to places where we need to understand context better. Um, so that's how I hope these reports can be of service. So let's talk about uh, what we looked at. Um, and, and what I'll do in this is talk mostly from Harvard X with a few connections out to MITx, but uh, to sort of narrow the scope of what we can talk about, I'll, I'll stay at home. Um, we launched six courses in the 2012, 2013 academic year. It is incredibly difficult to characterize how different these courses are and in how many different dimensions. There are courses that started earlier. There are courses that started later. There are courses that had long registration lead times and short registration lead times. There are courses that ran for many weeks. There are courses that ran for fewer weeks. Um, there are courses in the, in the humanities, in the social sciences, in computer sciences, in public health. Um, they differ in their size of registrants. Copyright X was a course uh, that admitted by application 500 students. They met in synchronous groups uh, every week online, guided by a third year law student who is a teaching fellow. Um, very different kind of open online learning experience to what is usually described among MOOCs. Um, David Malin taught uh, Introduction to Computer Science, which had um, over 170,000 registrants who appeared and participated in that course. One thing that almost all the courses do have in common is they almost all had an, an online life and a distance education life before Harvard X and edX started. Um, Ari Bernstein was telling me about his Human Health and Global Environmental Change class, that their center has a version of that course that they distribute in VH, via, via VHS tapes um, in the mid-90s. Uh, David Malin had offered uh, aspects of CS50.org and CS50.net um, as, a, as a vehicle for people to learn before there was Harvard X. Um, Justice, I think, is well known. Their WGVH produced a documentary film series, um, a kind of online course um, that was originally a series of 12 video lectures broadcast through WGVH. And then actually there was a website, justiceharvard.org, which you can still go to and has um, discussion forums and other ways for people to, to contribute online. Um, many of these faculty um, have long associations with the Harvard Extension School, which is a hidden gem of Harvard University. Um, so these courses, many of them had a life um, that predates Harvard X and predates edX. And that was one of the things that I found striking in looking at them. Um, but their differences, I think, are really important. And, and as a research team, we've come to believe that each of our courses are unique and beautiful, just like each of the snowflakes that are falling outside right now. And one of the things that we want to encourage in looking at our work is thinking about um, examining MOOCs, examining open online learning from the bottom up rather than from the top down, which is to say, rather than going immediately to the level of synthesis and generalizations, start by looking at each of the courses in their contexts. Start by saying, what were the instructors trying to do? What were their intentions? How does one course differ from another? How does one sector differ from another? And then, when you've understood that, concept, that context some, when you've started drawing some generalizations, then it becomes a more sensible time to draw generalizations across different courses. Uh, to make larger synthesis when you understand the constituent pieces a little better. So following that um, piece of guidance, I'm actually mostly going to talk today about one case study of one course and use it as a launching pad to talk about the whole enterprise. And I could have picked any of them, but I picked uh, the ancient Greek hero in part because it has a particularly happy ending, um, which you wouldn't expect for Greek heroes, but it's true. Um, the Ancient Greek Hero is a course that Professor Greg Naj has taught here uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences in one form or another for 35 years. Um, 
in the reports, what you'll find is that we proceed kind of along three lines. We first talk about the structure of the course, how it's built, what people can do, what the intentions of the faculty were. Then we talk about the students in those courses, who showed up, what they were interested in, where did they come from. Um, and then we talk about their participation. Once you have the structure and the students, you can say, well, what did the students who showed up actually end up doing within what was possible? And we'll sort of follow that pattern today. Um, Heroes X is an ambitious course. It begins with the question, what does it mean to be human? Um, what does it mean to teach a group of 43,000 people or to spark conversation amongst a group of 43,000 people to think about what it means to be human by looking at ancient Greek texts um, and thinking about this archetypal, this model of humanity, the hero, um, activated by Socratic dialogue? What does Socratic dialogue look like um, when you try to invite tens of thousands of people to participate in it? Let me give you a look inside the course. So I don't know how many of you have registered or taken an edX course before, but this is what the platform looks like on the inside. Um, and I'll give you a little tour and give you a little bit of vocabulary that might help you, and then talk about the structure of uh, Heroes X in particular. So the very leftmost side of uh, the HarvardX platform, the edX platform, is the courseware. This is where all the videos and all the problem sets are. It's where a significant, though not a portion, though not all, um, of the course materials are, the, the readings actually. Um, are kept separately in the discussion forms. Each of the course, every courseware is organized into the highest level unit, which is chapters. Um, and chapters is something that we'll return to a couple of times in our reports. Most of the chapters in Heroes X are called hours. There are 24 hours. They are equivalent to, the, or they are related to the 24 contact hours that Greg Naj has with his students in the residential version of Heroes X. Um, and the courseware sets things up to sort of guide people through the different components. This is what kind of the assignment in a typical hour would look like. This is hour two. So the, the first assignment is to invite people to participate in slow reading exercises. This is where the course team picks five or six passages that they encourage people to read very slowly and very deliberately. And in particular, they're trying to inculcate the skill of reading out of the text rather than reading into the text. They're trying to inculcate the skill of reading out of the text, which means to try to understand a text as a person in ancient Greece would have understood it. Um, reading into the text is understanding a text and bringing your own preconceptions, your own present ideas and morals and, and values to the text. Um, I actually think it's a pretty good metaphor for doing research case as well. Um, in our work, we're trying to read out of the course rather than read into the course. We're trying to understand the courses um, in the context that the instructors are teaching them and in the context of their intentions, um, rather than bringing our own con preconceptions of what MOOCs are supposed to be to the conversation. Students do fast reading every week, where they're supposed to blitz through uh, a few scrolls of the Iliad and that sort of thing, not feeling like they need to get hung up if they don't understand something, just moving through, moving through. There are a series of videos that meet a, a number of different uh, instructional tasks. Some of them are lectures and disquisitions that explain the context or explain the period. Um, some of them are these beautiful uh, poetic readings of the slow reading texts that are done by students and other members of the board of readers and the course team. There's discussion and conversation among different folks on, on the course team. There are often connections to contemporary texts. So in hour two, they watch some clips from Blade Runner and Total Recall and see how the ancient Greek hero resurfaces in our own time. The assessments uh, that are in Heroes X, there's no midterm exams or finals. Um, there are uh, sets of multiple choice questions that appear every week. The question sets uh, tend to be more sort of factual kinds of things. Who said what? What does this term mean? What happened before what? Um, that sort of thing. The close reading exercises are a little different. So in there, the course team presents uh, students with a passage from one of, usually one of the slow reading texts or a parallel text. Um, and then uh, the professor or one of the course team annotates the text. And students need to choose one of three tags to apply to the text. One of the tags um, is an interpretation of the text that reads out of the text. One of them reads into the text. One of them does a little bit of both. And you're supposed to find the one that reads out of the text. Um, so that, if you're participating hour to hour, week to week, is uh, what your routine would look like. The course team is very clear to participants that there's no one right way to encounter and engage this material. To be a certificate seeker, simply complete all of the assessments and quizzes in a satisfactory manner. You are also free to change your mode of participation from explorer to certificate seeker or the other way around. You can change from one mode to another at any time between now and the end of the course. 
For those who are explorers in the course, that way of participating is just as legitimate and honorable as a certificate option. So Greg Noggs makes this invitation to students in the course saying, we've created a learning experience for you. Use that learning experience. We're not here to, to, to certify people's competence, although we can do that, but that's not, that is not our only goal. Our goal is to, is to invite as many people as possible, from total novices to committed Hellenic scholars, to come in and have a meaningful learning experience, and particularly a meaningful conversation in the discussion forums and so forth. Um, for us as researchers, doing justice to this course means trying to respect that intention, to be able to say, all right, so how can we start operationalizing? How can we start visualizing some of these ideas? So that's what we've tried to do. So this is what Greg Naj proposed, uh, who showed up. Um, some of the demographics that I will show you might be familiar if you've seen some of the other recently published MOOC literature. Um, so like many um, of these open online courses, the gender distributions tilts towards males. It tends to be cr pretty close to even in the more humanities oriented courses. Um, it tends to be more tilted towards men in the science and technology courses. Um, many of the participants already have either a bachelor's degree or an advanced degree, a master's degree or a doctorate, though not all. Um, and one of our points in our, um, in our papers is that small percentages are not small numbers. Um, that even if 5% of the population uh, fits a category, that can be thousands or hundreds or tens of thousands of people. Um, one way in which Heroes X is a little different from the rest of uh, Harvard X, it skews a little bit older. Um, there are more 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 year olds, so you can decide what that means for the fate of human civilization, um, that younger folks aren't reading these texts. You could look at these demographics and then think to yourself, you know, from sort of a public policy perspective, what would be the ideal distributions? Um, if we lived in the most equitable possible world, what would we want these distributions to look like? And if they don't look the way you want them to look, then we can start thinking about how would we design courses differently? How would we design marketing? How would we design teaching? How would we design the kinds of courses we offer that would shift that? But one caution I would offer you is I would suggest that there's not one distribution that would be perfect for all of the sectors of the university. Let me give you an example. So one of the reasons why one of the factors driving the very high degree attainment across uh, Harvard X is that we have very high levels of degree attainment in the courses offered by the School of Public Health. About 40% of folks in the biostatistics class health and numbers already had a master's degree. About 15% of folks already had a doctorate degree. So these are folks who are advantaged. These are folks who are elite in society. They're also people who have devoted their lives to the public welfare. And if we can help them do a better job devoting their lives to the public welfare, then from my point of view, that's a public policy win. Um, if the Graduate School of Education here offered a course to urban superintendents, the majority of people we would expect to register for that course would be people with a master's degree and people with a doctorate, like most urban superintendents have. There are also people who've devoted their lives um, to serving the most vulnerable students in our country, in our society. Um, it would be a great thing to offer a class for urban superintendents, even if most of the people who came um, had demographic characteristics that were different from the general population. Um, we might think differently about that than we would, for instance, uh, introduction to computer science. We might think an introduction to computer science class ought to have more people who are able to get at it um, with less educational background. And in fact, among Harvard X courses, um, our introduction to computer science class had the highest proportion of certificate earners who didn't have a bachelor's degree. About 40% of folks who earned a certificate in CS50 uh, uh, didn't have a bachelor's degree. Um, Sergi Nesterko, who's my fellow uh, Harvard X research fellow, or, uh, won a grant from the Gates Foundation. He's a principal investigator for this grant. And he came back from a conference recently and he said sort of one of the themes of that conference was that there will be no grand unifying theory of MOOCs. Um, the, the pedagogical implications, the public policy implications of different decisions, different courses, different way we approach these things will differ from course to course, from discipline to discipline, from sector to sector. Um, and that's one of the things that we've tried to honor by releasing 16 reports at the same time, is to encourage people to think about each of these pieces on their own terms, um, and to resist the idea um, that we can write headlines that say MOOCs work or MOOC, MOOCs don't. Um, they're different in different places. And then the real question becomes, if we have these tools for large-scale, low-touch learning, where can we deploy them most effectively? Um, how can we take the resources that are, that are sort of saved by them and deploy them to places where high-touch matters more? One of the things that we've tried to do um, to honor the principles that Greg Nagy talked about of trying to have, uh, of, of trying to say that there are multiple legitimate ways of participating in courses, is to think about how could we classify students in ways that would capture some of the diversity of the ways people are using courses. So this will take a second to go through, um, but you'll see on the Y, this is a scatter plot. Um, each dot represents a, a person who's registered. 
Um, on the y-axis is the student's grade. Um, it goes from 0 to 100. If you score more than a 50 on the assessments, um, then you earn a certificate. Um, on the, on the y-axis is the number of chapters they viewed. Um, and again, to view a chapter, you simply click on any piece of content within the highest level organizational unit. And you'll see that all the points fall below the diagonal um, because all the assessments are nested inside the uh, hours of the course. And so you have to open the chapters to take the assessments. I'll give you a little tour. Um, so on the top above the bar, that quadrant sort of, or those two quadrants uh, contain the folks who are certified who earned a certificate. In the bottom right, um, we've characterized those folks as explorers. So these are people who didn't earn a certificate, but viewed more than 50% of the chapters. Um, in the bottom left, uh, we call those folks viewers, or, or people who viewed, um, who uh, didn't uh, earn a certificate and viewed less than half the chapters. And in the very bottom left, we have the folks who are only registered, people who registered for the course but never entered the courseware at all. Um, hopefully one of the intuitions that you've picked up uh, looking at this while I've been chatting about it is that, geez, the dots are kind of everywhere. Um, the possibility space, just about everywhere in the possibility space is occupied by an account, by a use case. Um, just about any way you can imagine using these combinations of course materials, somebody's out there doing it. Um, we highlighted a few extreme cases. Um, in the top right are the completionists, the people who got the perfect score um, and opened all the parts of the course. In the bottom right, we borrow MIT's term for auditor, which is listener, to characterize the people who opened up all of the parts of the course um, and then got a grade of zero, either because they, they chose not to try any of the problems or didn't get any of them right. Um, and then that, that funny little point sort of in the bottom left of the certified is the optimizer, um, the student or account that, that had the lowest possible grade and fewest numbers of chapters opened and still earned a certificate. Um, <laughs> which might be an account which is participating in activities that in other contexts we would call cheating. Um, it might be someone who's really excited about earning as many certificates as they possibly can and is tearing through courses until they get the requisite grade and then moving along. It's, it's hard to know, but these are kind of interesting use cases to explore. And then when you make some comparisons across courses, when we look at justice and health and numbers and health and environmental change, we see the same kinds of patterns. Um, where just about anywhere in the possibility space, there could be a use case, there is someone. People are engaging in these courses in all kinds of different ways. And then what you do is you get a great psychometrician like uh, Andrew Ho, who can help us uh, make these comparisons in fair ways across all the courses and rescale the grades uh, so all these things are constant. And here are the 17 courses from uh, Harvard X and MITx all together. And again, one of the things that you see is that the possibility space is full. You know, one of the things that jumped out to us is that there are nearly as many people in this explored category as there are in this certified category. There is nearly as many people who are looking at more than half the course materials, but not um, or looking at more than half of the high-level units of the course, but not earning a certificate, as there are certificate earners. And that viewed category of nearly half of all registrants, or maybe a little more than half of all registrants, um, has all kinds of diversity within it as well. Um, there are all kinds of people who are having meaningful learning experiences at different points along this. And particularly, those kinds of meaningful learning experiences are not captured when you summarize all this activity in a dichotomous variable like a certification rate, when you say you're either a zero or a one. Um, I have a student, uh, I teach uh, undergraduates who want to become pre-service teachers at MIT, uh, and I had a student who came into class uh, this past semester, and, he, and she said, you know, hey, Professor Ray, um, you know, I took this MOOC over the summer. And I said, oh, which one? She said, I took uh, Joe Bowler's How to Teach Math from Stanford. Stanford has been wonderful collaborators with us with their Open edX group. And I said, well, how'd it go? And she said, uh, you know, not so good. I, you know, I got busy and I dropped out. I said, oh, well, you know, what'd you think of the course? How much of it did you get through? And she just sort of went on a tear immediately. Oh, we studied Carol Dweck and theory of mindset and growth mindset and fixed mindset. And there are these things that we were reading last week and here's how it applies and so forth. And I'm thinking, okay, so you took a foreign body of content and skills and knowledge and you developed a sufficient mastery to come into my classroom and apply that knowledge to a foreign context. That's exactly what learning is. Um, but of course, she's a zero, right? You know, you could be a zero or a one and she was a zero. Um, so part of what we're trying to do, um, especially in these voluntary informal learning environments, is to say, okay, um, how can we start characterizing the kinds of learners which professors like Greg Naj are inviting into their course? Um, and then a shout out to the ultimate optimizer. Um, so these folks showed up, and what did they do? 
Um, one of the things that we have to talk about uh, is grades and certification rates, although I will say that if you're a huge fan of MOOC certification rates, um, you won't find among, uh, friends amongst our author group. Um, but you have to sort of present these things because that's what the media wants. Um, and so this was our approach to that. A certification rate's a funny thing. Um, you have to have a numerator and you have to have a denominator. The numerator is obvious. You take the number of people who are certified. The denominator to choose is less obvious. Um, so what we do instead of sort of taking a position is say, here are a whole bunch of denominators and we'll divide them for you, but you can pick whichever one you want. Um, so there were, um, out of the 43,000 registrants, there were 3.2% who earned a certificate. Out of the 25,000 people who viewed the course, there were 5.5% who earned a certificate. Out of the 5,446 people who attempted at least one pro or got at least one problem correct, 26% earned a certificate. Um, and out of those who explored more than half the course, 80% got a certificate. Now, which one of these is the real certification rate? Well, none of them and all of them. There's probably useful inferences that you could make out of any of them. And none of them alone is sort of a sufficient summary statistic of the quality of a course. Um, an anecdote to full, further illustrate this. Um, so on July 24th, Anant Argawal went on Stephen Colbert's The Colbert Report. And sure enough, in the days following, we experienced the Colbert bump. We have now scientific proof the Colbert bump is about seven days long. Um, the number of registrations during that period um, following the Colbert bump tripled. Um, and you can see that on the top bar. Um, very few people were getting certified during this period because most of the courses were closed. Um, you can register for a course after it closes. In some cases, all of you right now could go and sign up for Health and Numbers, PH 207. You'd be a dropout the moment you registered. Um, but you'd have a meaningful learning experience if you wanted to. The whole course is there for you. So, but it turns out that the, that the number of certified users, uh, the people that went on to be certified to, per day only doubled. So of course, if you double the number of people getting certified and you triple the registration rate, then your certification rate will go down. Um, so if you use that as a proxy for quality, then Stephen Colbert made all of Harvard X courses worse. Um, and that's impossible to believe because Stephen Colbert would never hurt us. Um, <laughs> What it points to is kind of the truthiness of MOOC completion rates. Like the numbers are there, right? There's a numerator, you can pick a denominator, you can do division, it's all there for you to use. But the inferences that we're making based on these rates are probably not well supported. And there's probably other ways that we could be thinking about course quality. Part of the challenge that we have as researchers is not just to sort of poo-poo certification rates, but to try to come up with some of these things um, that can help us come up with alternative metrics. Um, we've been spending a lot of time thinking about persistence, thinking about how do we measure how long people stay within the course. Um, it's been really interesting to think about because of the incredible asynchronicity, um, the signature asynchronicity of these learning experiences. Um, you can register for courses in some cases months in advance. Um, you can sign up to, for courses after the courses end. Um, Part of what this suggests to us is that there's a couple dimensions of time that we need to consider. One dimension of time you might call like absolute time or course relevant time, where t equals zero is the day that the course launches. But if people can join at multiple points, so we could also think about relative time. We could think about a time scale where t equals zero is the day that you happen to enter, which might be week negative 11 in absolute time or week 19 um, in absolute time. So here are some things that we can play around with this asynchronicity. Um, and this is one sort of way to visualize it. So on the x-axis is absolute time um, from about day negative 90 when registration opens to day 170 um, when, uh, when all the materials from the course are due. There's no intermediate deadlines in Heroes X. Um, what I've done here is taken daily registration cohorts and I've tried to ask the question, um, what proportion of people who register in any given day go on to earn a certificate? And one of the things you see is that it's actually relatively constant throughout this whole period, which is true for many courses and not for all of them. Um, but about 2% of people who signed up three months in advance uh, finish the course, and then about 2% of people who signed up in the day or two before the course end um, finish the course. These are, you know, some of these folks might be engaging in behaviors that we would call cheating in other contexts. Um, some of these people, too, might be like binge MOOC takers. It would be people who are like, you know, last weekend I did season three of The Wire. This weekend I'm doing Heroes X. Um, next weekend, Downton Abbey. Um, and again, you know, these methods of participating are as legitimate and honorable as any other. But you know, one of the things that we've really had fun playing around with is to try to make some sense of this relative time. And this is probably the geekiest figure that I'll show you, and hopefully we can make some sense of it together. Um, so what I've done here is I've grouped people into weekly registration cohorts from week negative 11, 11 weeks before the course started, to week 19, um, from darkest to lightest. And I've plotted them um, on relative course weeks. So week zero is the week that that cohort entered the course. For weeks negative 11 to zero, it's zero. Um, and then for you know, uh, t equals zero for the cohort of week nine, um, is, uh, is absolute week nine. Um, 
On the y-axis is the hazard probability, and that's probably summarized by something like the proportion of people in any proportion of a cohort in any given week that persists on to the next week. Um, while saying all this, ideally you've had an intuition which is something like, hey, all of the lines are stacked on top of each other. And if you saw that and noticed that, then uh, pat's on the back. Um, what that suggests is that regardless of where, when you enter a course, your sort of hazard profile, your survival rate in that cohort is very similar. Um, regardless of when you enter, people in the first, uh, a cohort is likely to become much, much smaller in the first week between, you know, a little bit, uh, between a little bit more than half and a little bit more than two thirds of cohorts will disappear within the first week. But hazard drops precipitously after that. Um, it's somewhere around 16% uh, in the second week and then in Heroes X it levels down around, uh, you know, 10% of a cohort leaving from week to week. Colloquially, we could say, um, if we can get you to stick around for a week or two in our courses, then we have you, or at least we're going to lose you at a much lower rate, regardless of when you enter. Um, we'll lose you at a much lower rate than we would have otherwise. Um, one design hypothesis that I have based on this, I'd love to see some courses experiment with the idea of saying, okay, if we know a bunch of folks are going to leave in their first encounter with the course, let's have the first encounter of the course be a summary of the whole course rather than an introduction to the course. Let's say, um, let's not have week one be the introduction to this topic, let's have it be, here's the whole topic, here's the most important idea that are there. I don't know if this would work. Um, I don't know if it's a good idea, but I think it would be worth kind of exploring and trying. And I sort of mentioned that to illustrate how I hope course developers start taking some of these data. None of these data tell you what to do as a course developer, um, but hopefully they give you some insights that you can apply your values and your teaching intuitions and all those kinds of things for and make more informed decisions. Um, and then, oh, I probably should have said that again, one of the things that you see across multiple <laughs> courses um, is the same kind of pattern from course to course, um, that we see this high attrition rate uh, initially and then declining on relative time um, for many of the courses that we look at. I think I'll pass on this one to keep things moving along. Um, I want to talk for a moment about, about activity, what kinds of things people do and about frames of reference. Um, so one of the things we could look at is the number of problems that people view and attempt over time. And one of the things that you can see, this is sort of another view of that attrition rate. Um, many people attempt the problems in hour one in the course, and then by the end of the course, there's sort of a cohort of about you know, 1,400, 1,500 people who are doing problems in all of the hours. Um, if you decide to use as your frame of reference a sort of residential course experience, then like maybe you could conceive of this as kind of disastrous. Like if you had a lecture of 100 students, and about half of them turned in the work on the first week, and by the end, you know, a very small portion of them were returning in the work, you'd think, oh, that's kind of a problem. Um, it's not clear that the course, the residential course, is the right frame of reference for these kinds of online learning experiences. If any of you have a familiarity um, with, uh, you know, online platforms, with web analytics, with those kinds of things, and this looks to you like a marketing funnel. There's a whole bunch of people who come in the top of the funnel and then enjoy some of your experience. You know, lots and lots of people read New York Times headlines. Fewer people read the articles. That's okay. What the New York Times wants to do is get as many people reading headlines as possible to bring them down further. Um, here's a, a comparison that I really like to illustrate this. So here's the same figure for Justice X, and it has the same pattern. Lots of people early on, and then fewer later on. Um, but recall that I told you that uh, Justice was originally published as a series of PBS videos. And in fact, these PBS videos are available online, the first 12 lectures. Um, they've been available since September of 2009. The first of these lectures um, has been viewed about 5 million times, maybe over 5 million times now. The second one, 1 1.2 million times, and then eventually it levels out um, at something like 200,000 or 300,000 views per video. I don't think any of us view this as kind of a crisis of attrition in PBS documentary series watching. Um, I think rather we look at this and we say, wow, Michael Sandel gave a 45-minute lecture on moral reasoning and got 5 million people to watch it. That's amazing. Um, that's an amazing opportunity to distribute his work. Um, so if you use, you know, your, your, the ways in which you interpret any of these data depend quite a bit on your frame of reference. And I would encourage you as you read the reports to play around with different frame of references. Um, what do things look like if you compare them to a course? What, if you've, what do things look like if you compare them to online media? What does it look like if you compare it to a book? Um, you'll have different value judgments and inferences and interpretations based on which of these you choose. Um, I'll, I'll do this one real quickly. Um, so one of the things that we can do is count the various activities that people do. So here's a count of the number of times that people clicked play um, on any video in the course, uh, from those who earned a certificate to those who didn't. And the distributions are in different places, as we might expect. People who do more stuff are more likely to earn a certificate. 
Um, but I actually think it's the, it's the tales of the distributions which are more interesting to me. There are people who didn't earn a certificate that viewed videos hundreds and thousands of times. There are people who earned a certificate that viewed videos only a few times. And again, some of these folks might essentially be sort of uh, clicking their way through the problems in the course. But there's also a series of books in this course, and there may be some folks who just said, well, I'm going to learn this, this material by reading the books and doing the problems, and that's it. And that's totally fine. Um, in fact, there's a comment in the discussion forums which says something like, if you want to do really well on the multiple choice questions, read the books first and don't watch the videos. Because the books kind of tee up the answers to the questions, and if you watch the videos, there's like all these different people talking about it, and there's all these different perspectives and a bunch of nuance, and it'll kind of confuse you. Um, so to maximize your opportunity to do well on the multiple choice questions, um, just uh, read the book first. So all of that is about performance and persistence and activity. Um, I've said very little about learning, and that's deliberate. Um, to some extent, we don't know nearly enough about what people are learning. Um, in some of the courses, if I had given you a different case study, we would have been able to say more. I think the folks um, teaching Introduction to Computer Science have built some incredible tools to be able to evaluate the quality of the code that you produce, the programs that you write, in terms of whether or not they work, in terms of their efficiency, in terms of their elegance, um, all of those kinds of features. To what extent do we know whether or not the people who took Heroes X know more what it means to be human? Um, to what extent can we say they can apply tropes of the Greek hero to meaningful experiences in their own lives? Um, that's hard. That's actually hard in any context. That's, you know, this is a problem that we inherit from our parent institutions. It's hard to know what people are learning. Um, but this is also a grand challenge for education. Let's not say, okay, in the past we'd have a tough time with this. Let's start saying to ourselves, okay, um, what can we do with these new resources that we have available to gain some more traction on these really important questions? I want to make sure you leave with the idea that having a big question mark around what exactly people are learning is a pretty serious issue for our, for our research. Um, Let's imagine that you're a business analytics person at Amazon, and you're interested in, does Amazon Prime work? What about the reviews, frequently bought together? Like, I'm so jealous of these people because they just have one number they care about in the end. You know, how many books did they sell? How much money did they make? Imagine trying to figure out whether or not Amazon Prime was working if you didn't know how many books you sold. Um, that's the kind of challenge that we're wrestling with. Um, and it's one that I hope that I'm, you know, that I'm very hopeful and optimistic we'll get better at being able to work with. Um, I think this taxonomy may point to some different directions. There's definitely some data out of the exhaust that we haven't exhumed yet. So we haven't looked very closely at the discussion forms. We haven't looked very closely at the particular patterns of responses to multiple choice questions. I think there are some very lightweight experiments that we can add. Um, uh, Gerard Sonnert and Philip Sadler from the Center for Astrophysics are uh, uh, incorporating a pre-course survey into CS50. Um, they have this really neat kind of computing readiness survey that's going to be very lightweight and it's going to give us some ability to, to look at differences in competence over time. We're going to say here's a baseline level of learning um, and here's what we can attribute to their experience in the course. My colleague at Mike Caulfield, I um, sh uh, shared some of this work with him, he's in Washington, and he said, you know what you guys really need is like evaluation strike teams. Um, let's train 10 graduate students to go out and randomly sample 100 people from each course and give them like a really rigorous hour-long oral examination. Um, and that would let you know what people are learning. Totally unscalable for certification, but might be really revealing for understanding kind of in the aggregate how much folks are learning. And then there's really exciting stuff that's happening right in the instructional core. Um, HarvardX has a developer, Phil Desen, um, who is uh, developing some annotation tools. People in the humanities have been demonstrating um, and developing their understanding using annotations for thousands of years. Um, and there might be some scalable insights that we can generate from uh, annotation tools about what people are learning. Um, so this is a huge challenge that we face, but I'm really excited for all the ways that we can work together to tackle it. It's the kind of grand challenge that Harvard and MIT should certainly be addressing. Um, I told you the story has a happy ending, and it did. Um, so here's what Professor Naj says in the afterword to the course. Don't laugh. Take the course again. Experience it again. Read all the things that you've read again. Think about them again. And it turns out that not all 43,000 people registered for the course again, but 4,326 people who registered for the 2012-13 version of Heroes X registered for Heroes X this spring, including 419 people who earned a certificate in the course. There are rules at places like Harvard and MIT about taking a course again if you've already passed it. Um, but there aren't rules on Harvard X. You can take this as many times as you want to. For centuries, the texts of the ancient world have promised rich rewards to those willing to commit to a lifetime of study. Through Heroes X, Professor Naj and his colleagues on the course team have extended that promise, and many have taken them up on the offer. And I think that's a satisfying place to end my piece of the discussion. Um, 
This is a tour, so go on from this little introduction and read the reports. I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to work with Andrew Ike, Sergi, Daniel, Tommy, and Jim on these projects. I hope you find the work rewarding, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what, uh, what Dean Long and, and Professor Levy have to say about the work, so thank you. Two discussants today. The first is Dean Long, and followed by Dan Levy from the Kennedy School. Dean Long. Uh, again. Um, first, I want to really commend Justin and the entire research team um, for this amazing work that they've been able to put together. I mean, just diving headfirst into a wealth of data without clear uh, conventions and even how should you present this? What are the right research questions? What are the right measures, the right metrics, and so forth? Um, and so the reports that they've produced are just a start for us to, to begin to understand what's happening with these courses. And I'm sure this is the beginning of years of fruitful investigation and research and on how uh, we can engage better with students and help them learn. Um, I also want to especially recognize Andrew Ho, who's in the audience, who has served as chair of the Harvard X uh, Research Committee, which I've been a part of. Um, and in this very messy, uncertain work has really led us very ably um, to getting to this first report and looking forward to the future of this. So thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm going to be brief because I know there's a lot of snow outside, and I'm sure there are a number of questions that you, you have. Dan and I both agreed uh, that we just kicked this off. Um, but start off by saying, you know, MOOCs have enormous potential in terms of increasing our access, access to students and engaging with a broader array of students. Um, but there are many questions and unknowns. Um, and here are just a few to start us off. Uh, first of all, who takes the courses? Uh, how do they choose to engage? What are they learning? And then the larger issue is what contributions are we, meaning Harvard, MIT, and others, making with these online courses? I've been part of many discussions around Harvard about these courses, and I have to uh, share that myself, along with many others I've talked to, we've had lots of ideas and suspicions about who's taking these courses and the answers to these questions, but up until now, they've really been untested assumptions. and We haven't even really known how to think about these courses. Um, and now we do know a little bit uh, to answer at least some of those questions. So we know a little bit about who's taking the courses, but of course, there are many follow-up questions to this. Um, what are their backgrounds? Um, we know a little bit about their education, their prior educational experiences in terms of degree, but do they know this course material? Are they vis revisiting it a second time? Um, importantly, what are the reasons for taking the courses? What are their motivations? What are they hoping to get out of the, the course? Um, and how do they intend to use the material? And so while we have this first pass and, and the numbers, um, what countries they're from, what their educational backgrounds, gender, and age, there are, of course, so many additional questions we'd like to know. Uh, we'd also like to know much more about how they choose to engage. So we can witness their actions, um, but what are the reasons for why some persist and others don't? Uh, is time on task really engagement? And so Justin didn't get into this, but we know a little bit about how long they're spending on a particular page or with a particular task, but we don't really know, well, did they just leave their computer open for the time? Are they engaging in a particular way? Um, and then, you know, uh, there's all this big data that's out there and all these little things that we could investigate to try to tease out some of that information, um, but there's surely much more information we'd like to collect, and it may not just be with log files, but actual um, qualitative researchers going in depth. Um, and then questions about, you know, what did they find to be the most and the least helpful? Because as instructors designing these courses, uh, they put together videos and texts and have been very engaging and so forth. But of course, they want to improve their courses over time. And so having some understanding of what really made an impact and engaged students um, helped them pers to persist and learn. Of course, there are two uh, key questions that we haven't even touched. Uh, one being, the, you know, Justin had the big question mark of, of what are they learning? Are they learning at all? Um, and then, again, the question, what contributions are we making with these online courses? Um, in terms of educational access, are we uh, bringing these courses to students who otherwise would not um, be able to take this material, um, towards the societal good of, of the importance of education? Um, and there are many normative questions we'd love to debate, but first we have to have good basic facts on what's going on before we can debate about the good or, or the bad. 
Um, so I say we're making progress towards answering these questions. Of course, these courses are not static. They continue to change. Instructors continue to try to improve them. Um, and on the Harvard X Research Committee, we've had a number of discussions about uh, different kinds of experiments, A-B testing, uh, things that we could randomize. And when you have the scale that Harvard X has, as well as MITx and other courses, that you can try different things to really see how does that influence who engages, who chooses to take, uh, watch the videos or take the assessments, um, and eventually pushing on uh, towards learning outcome. So we're off to a great start, and I want to, again, say kudos to the research teams and Justin um, for, for kicking this off, and I look forward to seeing where we are a year from now. Thank you. Dan Levy from the Kennedy School of Government is also co-chair of the Harvard X Research Committee. So you, so you're, I need you're to be here. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, the camera will catch it. So we're talking about research about learning, but I think we have violated one principle, which is as tantalizing as Justin's presentation was and Bridget's comments, where you've all been sitting here listening for the last 50 minutes. So I've been given 10 minutes. I would like to sacrifice one of them and ask you to discuss with the person next to you what, are, what is the key takeaway you take from this so that you are ready to listen for the next nine minutes. So please go ahead and do that. It. There are some courses that leave the material open for a while, other courses that uh, there's not a moment in which they say, all right, you can, yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe some courses will do, but no, no fishing. Yeah. Certainly no official position on that. Maybe maybe the faculty members of that course decided. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. All righty. All righty. Uh, thank you. I, I, I hope that you at least left with one or two key takeaways uh, from Justin's excellent presentation. So I want to I wanna begin by congratulating Justin and his uh, co-authors, particularly Andrew Ho, who so ably has led the research committee, and, and Ai Chong, uh, because the work they have done is not only informative and very good, but I happen to have been aware of many of the difficulties they faced in trying to make meaning of the data in the system. And remarkable progress was made over the past year uh, in making meaning of the data. So, so I would like to start there. So what I would like to do is to <coughs> offer two reactions to the presentation that Justin uh, just made, and then offer a couple of thoughts for future research, some of them echoing uh, Justin and Bridget. So the first re uh, reaction to Justin's report is that the report, the series of reports actually, uh, paint a very nice picture on who signs up and engages in these online courses. And they tell us who persists and the level of activities and all of that. And that by itself is very useful because when we started this, we didn't even know who would sign up uh, uh, to these courses. 
But perhaps just as helpful for the research community interested in online learning is I think they have helped us develop a language with which to understand the analytics coming out of these online courses. I found their typology of users, the registrants, the viewers, the explorers, and the certified to be very helpful in understanding how people engage in this environment. And as any typology, you can quibble with the thresholds that they use. You can say, oh, I wouldn't have said the 50%, the explorers, I would have done it less or more. But at least it gives us a language to describe and speak about the users that engage in this world. My second reaction is that the reports, uh, and I really do recommend that you read uh, uh, at least the ones that you're most interested in, they go to great length in telling us and demonstrating how our framework for residential education is not that useful in understanding the world of MOOCs. And I think that's a, that's a very important uh, lesson to be had. They persuasively argued, and no matter what the headlines will say today and tomorrow, about the caution of using certification rates to measure the success of uh, courses. And as I was uh, thinking about or making the mistake of trying to find a parallel in the residential education, uh, the certification rates that you would calculate by just saying, all right, the number of certified divided over the number of registered, I think would be the equivalent to teaching a residential course here at Harvard and then counting anyone who ever expressed any interest in the course, maybe showed up the first day, opened the door and said, oh, this is not the course I want and then just left. All of those people would be in the denominator of this uh, equation. So this is not to defend or justify, you know, why is it 5%? This is more to set the context, and as Justin uh, so persuasively argued, it really depends on what is it that you're looking for to decide which denominator you look at. Um, I, uh, I think I, I want to stop there because you might have more specific questions about the report, but I do want to offer a couple of directions for future research as we think about the, the work that uh, they have done. I mean, one, Justin said this, the report said this, uh, Bridget said, said this, but I, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of helping us understand what people are learning in these courses. I mean, we're an institution of learning, and for us it's not enough for people to just come and explore material. Thinking about that, it's pretty clear to me, and again, this is where the parallels with residential education are very dangerous. Uh, in residential education, we think of a course as the unit by which we're going to measure learning. And it's pretty clear that that's inadequate, at least in this environment of uh, MOOCs, because there are some people who come and engage in some fraction of the course content, and maybe there's some learning going on there. Maybe there's not, but maybe there's some learning going on there. And so having the course being the unit seems to me uh, rather limiting, the unit by which we measure uh, learning. And in terms of learning, I'm not talking only about did people learn in this course, but I think the key challenge is to think about, right, what are the features of the online environment that are most conducive to learning? Because this is what's going to help us design better courses and better learning experiences for our students. And I sort of think that research there would be very helpful. This is the fourth quadrant of uh, Justin's uh, typology. And we haven't been able to do much of that. I think partly uh, there are obstacles that are there. You know, how do you measure whether someone learned in the Heroes X course uh, is a challenge, although uh, not an insurmountable one. But partly there have also been technological barriers to be able to do the A-B testing kind of uh, experiments that I think are most conducive to learning this. And I think with the help of edX, we are um, hopefully soon going to be able to do uh, these kinds of experiments. And my second and last reaction to directions of future research is that a lot of what we talked about today is about the MOOC world. But as Peter said at the beginning, uh, 
HarvardX is not just about MOOCs. It's also about how we can design better learning environments for our own on-campus students. And so conducting research that helps us think about how we can design online experiences that complement what we do in our classrooms in a way that leads to more learning seems like a very important uh, research uh, priority. So that's it. I want to congratulate again Justin and the whole team for doing this. And I think Bridget and I stuck to our allotted time. So now Q&A for Justin and others. My instructions say that you're supposed to be up here, too, answering questions. Yeah, well. But in any case, the floor is now open for questions. Um, and uh, I'll begin right in front with Dean Lambert. So the question that uh, Dean Lambert just asked was, um, in studies of classroom learning, do we look at students using some of those same kinds of characteristics, um, you know, of those who explore, those who get certified, those who view, th those kinds of dimensions? I mean, I would say that, that, it's, that it's reasonable to think about student experience and expectations for students in different contexts in different places. So in a classroom, you know, like in my classroom when I was a ninth grade world history teacher, if some of my students were only exploring the material and not getting certified, like, well, that would be a huge problem. I would lose my job, so forth. Um, and, uh, and so I think there are reasons to, to, to think about things differently. It's also the expectations we set. If we were to offer courses that say, um, we're going to invite a bunch of people into this course and we're going to offer it for credit and you're going to have to pay a bunch of money for it, you know, particularly if we take the most vulnerable populations of remedial students in for doing that, we would have to think really differently about certification rates. Um, I think we certainly know um, that diversity is a hallmark of people's learning experiences, that there's all kinds of different brains that are out there. They approach materials in different ways. They make different meaning of it. Um, and we should expect, particularly in these kinds of informal learning environments, that uh, that, that would be characteristic here. Um, you know, I mean, I think part of what your question points to a little bit is there are some things which are very much on the, on the line. Um, you know, you all are offering some courses, which I, I think this is some totally fascinating experience. Experiments. Um, it, when Heroes X launched again this fall, you could take Heroes as a as a, a Gen Ed student in the college. You could take Heroes as an edX student. You could take Heroes as a student in the Extension School. All three groups use the same courseware. All of them received sort of different levels of services and different kinds of certification afterwards. Um, you know, it would be more. It would be if you know if the certification rates in the Harvard Extension School look like they do in the edX population of people who have you know no investment and so forth. We'd think about them differently. Some of actually some of the recent, uh, I was thinking about Dustin Tingley's report the other day, some of the recent data we're gathering on um, courses going on now suggest, in fact, that we can clearly distinct learning modes going on among the population, and that they evaluate different parts of the course, course quite differently. So, yes. We have a microphone, microphones that are traveling around. We'd like you to use them because we're streaming this live. Um, yes. Could some of you, okay. Could some of you comment on? Um, you mentioned uh, Justin Coursera. Have you been trading information on some of the data? I, I understand they're completely different models, and Coursera is for profit. But when you think of like University of Phoenix, that's so sophisticated and is, you know, like an enterprise. I mean, have they been looking at learning data, and is there any relationship or partnership um, there? Because some of these places have advanced in a very different way and have a different focus than we do. But could, could you comment on that for benchmarking yeah. or how we might think about that? Because I'm asked that by some of the people that are interested in this, our alumni and whatnot. And I'm curious how you've um, put that question out there, or if we have good partners or it's just us. No, no, and, and these folks will have different answers too, but I can say that uh, one of the things that's been really exciting about this endeavor is, I would say most of those partnerships now are still at an informal level, but I think they're growing and deepening. Um, so Philip Schmidt of the Media Lab uh, hosted a conference last week about motivation and online learning, where um, the vice president of the Apollo Group that owns the University of Phoenix, where a researcher from Iversity, which is a European version of Coursera, where someone from the Florida Virtual School, where someone from uh, DelftX, one of our partners in the edX consortium, um, I was there 
people from MITx were there. There was a whole range of folks who were there coming together, very much sharing data, sharing ideas. I mean, sharing data is tricky. There's a whole sort of hoops of de-identification and student privacy. But one of the things that we're going to be doing next month is we're, we're, we're hoping to do next month is we're leading towards a release of our first data set. Um, we're still working on de-identifying it, but we're basically racing as fast as we can to get whatever tranches of data we can safely and reasonably make publicly available available um, so that we can have other people who are, who are doing this research. And, and folks at MIT's institutional research have been invaluable in that. Um, the folks at IQSS, I'm sure, are going to be central in sharing that work. Um, but I would say at, right now, there's already really good partnerships. You know, I gave, I gave a similar version of this talk at Coursera, um, and half of their staff came up, it came out to see it. You know, like, like people are interested in, in doing this work, and those, I gave it at, at uh, Stanford, and their folks at, at Open edX came there. So I think informal partnerships that are going to be built more and more into formal relationships. But the, these guys may have I don't know why, you, why you're, you're taking, giving up our competitive advantage. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, just to, to add to that, I think, you know, while a lot of this is new and we're trying to figure out the conventions and so forth, we do realize there is a lot of other work on MOOCs as well as online education. I see my colleague here at, at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Chris Didi, who does work on online learning. Although there is an aspect of this that is different when you have hundreds of thousands of people who are coming in who aren't necessarily taking this for a program or, you know, it's different than just the smaller kind of targeted online education. Um, and so a lot of, um, you know, as a member of the research committee, we've asked, well, what does the field know in general about this? How can we use that to inform our work, our question, our framing? But also keeping in mind, I think Justin really emphasized this, that context really matters. And every course is a different story. And what we're trying to accomplish in these courses differs um, in general as a package, but also different for each individual one. And so some of this, we've thought about general questions, um, data we should collect, framing and so forth, but others are very course specific in what we might be able to test, what we might be able to learn, what kind of outcomes and measures might be really important. Let me say one other thing about data sharing is that uh, another thing next month, Sergi Nesterko has been building this incredible set of what we're calling interactive insights, this platform for letting people um, get into the data to look at visualizations, to look at different courses from different perspectives, and that'll be coming out soon, I think. Some of it's already ready kind of in beta um, at, Harvard X, at the HarvardX website under HarvardX Insights, and I think people are going to be really excited to be able to delve into some of these questions at the course level, um, both for HarvardX courses and MITx courses, so it's going to be a great resource for, for some of this. Did we have a, okay, yes, yeah. Kathleen? I had a, a similar question as hers in terms of qualitative research at the, in the MOOC space. So when you go to Coursera, I mean, do you feel that all of these institutions are also coming to this realization that qualitative research is really important and that we need to know how we're going to do it? Um, so I probably wouldn't speak for Coursera in particular on that and what exactly they're doing. You know, they're pretty, I mean, they will tell you that they're pretty busy shipping product. Um, and so they have. But, I mean, other, other MOOC yeah, so people for, so in for instance, the space uh, that are thinking that qualitative research. Amy Collier from Stanford Open edX and George Velatanios, who's at Royal Roads University, got a grant from the same program that Sergi uh, won a grant from, the, the Gates Foundation. And they have a project which is called something like MOOCs, The Lived Experience, um, where they're doing some research across different institutions. So I think some of it's bubbling up. Um, a, a fellow Berkman colleague next month is going to release a book, uh, Dana Boyd, called It's Complicated, The Social Life of Teens. Um, and instead of, and, and it's going to be one of the most important books about youth um, and their interactions with media. And we probably have more quantitative data about uh, youth's interaction with media than ever before. But this book is based on hundreds of interviews with kids. It turns out that like, if you ask kids a ton about their lives, they can tell you all kinds of useful and interesting things. And I think that might be one touchstone that helps us think about um, you know, what would it look like if we had 200 interviews 300 interviews with different kinds of students in these online learning environments. You know, what, what would that inform us and how would that help us understand the quantitative data? Um, it's all about methodological pluralism. Uh, question over here. Uh, um, I think when you, when you started out, you, you mentioned when, when people register, you'll have a, a different question for 50% of the group. Is it possible once the course gets going to vary some of the testing on some of the students and, and not? And, and does that help? the way they're learning or what, what they're perceiving? Yeah, that's an incredibly exciting frontier. There's more and more functionality being built into edX to make that possible. Um, and I think, you know, it, when, again, you know, one of the things I wanted to tee up is that 
a year from now, two years from now, there's going to be lots of different kinds of research that we're doing that we weren't able to do in the first six months. Where we are after six months is totally great, um, but there's going to be much more of that kind of stuff. The, the other thing I would say about it is the first ex a lot of the first experiments we're going to do, a lot of them might be easy kind of things. They might be sort of hanging motivational posters above assessments, that kind of stuff. Um, but as we get more practice and as we build deeper relationships with faculty, more of it's going to get really into the core of, of what matters most. I think that one of my concerns as, as you guys are doing this is that we need to be sure that, or I'd like us to be sure, that we're taking these findings from A-B testing, for example, and feeding them very quickly back into the course design teams, um, rather than waiting you know, months later to discover something, that we'd like to have it be almost you know, within, within days that we can start to start to learn something and say, oh, well, we better change that. Right. More questions? Yes, uh, one in back and then one in front here. Oh, I have a microphone. No, okay, no, I'm, I'm getting trying to get the mic, but there's somebody here too. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Oh, uh, so it seemed to me that 20 courses a semester is quite an ambitious program, and I just wondered, how is the balance between getting more courses online that you need for research with making sure there are sufficient resources for the research? Because it seems to me as a university that that research is really a major contribution that Harvard and MIT can make as much as getting co content out there to a larger audience. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> um. There's a correct answer here, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question right now. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, and I should say I'm not a researcher, so. Okay. I, I think that, that the importance and value of the research is going to become apparent as time goes by, but that we have lots of, one of the things we already know is that different courses uh, the publics for different courses are different and respond differently. That the age distributions are different, that the place distributions are different, um, and the the sort of learning, probably the learning styles of these groups are different. So I think even if it was just about research, I think we still want to do a whole lot of different kinds of courses. The other thing is that, uh, you know, Harvard's commitment is that its online offerings have to reflect the diversity, intellectual diversity of the university. Um, and that means that we have courses in poetry, and we have courses in public health, and we even have courses in on, on education, right? So, and we, I think we need to do all of those. But yes, it is ambitious, and it is expensive, and the, as you leave, the other ushers will be collecting. <laughs> We have the uh, right down here. In front. I'll, I'll add quickly one thing to that is that while we have tremendous, we have huge numbers and a great deal of power to do examination between students, if you're actually interested in questions about course design, if you only have six courses to look at, if you only have 20 courses to look at, you actually don't have a lot of variation from course to course. Um, and so one of the advantages of having more courses appear is we're going to eventually be able to say, well, now that we have you know 50 courses in the humanities and 45 in the, in the natural sciences and 30 in the social sciences, we can start drawing some conclusions perhaps about them that we wouldn't be able to do if there's two and four and three. Um, my question is, what is the biggest challenge you're facing now in your research? And how can like course design teams help you to overcome your challenge? This is spoken by one of the course design, member of a course design team, yes. Yeah, the, 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 China, the China X team is incredible. I arrive every morning, and there are a bunch of them there at work, and I leave every afternoon, and there's still a bunch of them there at well, work. They're not allowed to go home. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> and they have a good course because of it. Um, so I think what will happen is as, um, as the course development teams get their, the feet underneath them more, get more of the courses that are developed, get, get, get sort of more confidence in their doing, get more familiarity with their doing, maybe get into the courses in the second and third run. Um, what I'm excited to do is to have conversations with, with, with our research teams and course development teams where we say, what are the most important issues that you're wrestling with, um, and how can we do design research that helps us try out new pedagogies, that help us explore new ideas, that help us develop new tools. Um, and it's going to involve you know, the most precious resource, which is your time and the faculty 
faculty time and our time to be able to really think through those kinds of issues. Um, so, so one of the things that you can be doing is thinking about, you know, if you could study things as much as possible, what would that be? And then I think the other challenge that I would have to course development teams, and this is hard to do while you're in the midst of production, um, is be thinking about how can we design these kinds of studies in ways that they're so rigorous that we can publish them broadly with wide audiences. So that we're doing studies that's not just how do we make China X better? How do we make the teaching of Chinese history and culture better um, at Harvard, among historians at Harvard, among Chinese historians across the world, historians across the world, um, doing the kind of research that, I mean, there's one level of research that every instructor does, which is confirms their instructional hunches. Um, every instructor in any kind of course varies things from course run to course run um, and gathers some data that make, helps them make changes to their satisfaction. Um, but in the work that we want to do, I think we want to have a higher bar where we can say the, the things that we're finding are so rigorous and so compelling um, that we'll be able to generate conversations across the academy about them. And, and let me give another example of that the research committee, a, a debate that we had. So you want to do research, and one question you have is, who are your students? Um, well, how many questions can you ask? You know, if you're going to survey people who register for the course, how many questions can you ask? Now, you're not really sure who's going to show up, so you can't really go to the literature and say, well, if it's five questions, then we're not going to discourage too many people, but if it's ten, people might choose not to register. Because, again, your goal is to make it as easy as possible for people to start engaging with the material. So I remember a number of, of debates that we would have with the research team saying, we'd love to get data on 30 different um, characteristics of people who are signing up for the courses, but we know we can't ask 30 questions. Can we ask five? Can we ask 15? And then experimenting, you know, in a very deliberate way, experimenting with how many questions can we ask, can we survey new registrants, and still have them participate in the course. And we can't make assumptions about that because we don't know who's going to show up for the course. And so that's one of the early kind of experiments that you do. And until you know that answer to that question, you can't get to the second question with after figuring out how, what's the maximum number of questions you can ask, just background information, of then the next question of how are they engaging, how are they persisting, are they learning. And so this takes a very deliberate, very thoughtful process that the team is really engaged with to answer some of those early just how many questions can we put on a survey that in so many other fields of research, we already have established conventions. We can go to the literature, but when you don't know who's going to show up, even very basic questions become these huge debates um, among a group of experts who are, who are anxious. And we'd love to be able to make everyone fill out a 100-page survey. But of course, that's not going to happen. So you know, there are always trade-offs and decisions that have to be made. Yeah. So just uh, one of the implications of uh, moving some of the research to Justin's fourth quadrant is precisely the importance of the course development teams in helping do the research. Um, Justin and his team of collaborators could do this research with some access to the course uh, material to be able to make sense of the findings they had, but that access was not as critical as it would be to do the kinds of research of trying to find out what features of the environment would lead to more learning. So you seem to be an eager enthusiast, and we should talk about how we can make that happen. Well, you know, one of the things that we've actually seen now in, in the China X course is that in, in all courses, discussion forums, um, participants go, go down over time. We were lucky to get around 1,000 people to do a survey that involved narrative answers. Well, we now have around 1,000 people in the discussion forum who are now writing three- and four-page essays to each other and commenting on it so that um, it may be that what we find is that uh, that you that the commitment to the course starts to go up as time goes by right for some for people those. as well yeah. we have time for another yes have people tried doing something like I'll give you a hundred dollars cash if you get a certificate does that work mm. <laughs> um, the New York City experiment, right? Ten dollars for your homework. Yeah, yeah there, I mean, there's definitely like financial incentives directly to students in other contexts. I'm not aware of. Uh, I mean, one thing that would maybe be kind of close to that um, is when uh, in the San Jose State Udacity partnership for the summer remedial courses, they waived the registration fees for their students. So they were they weren't giving out cash, but they were giving out um, transferable college credit for free. Um, and that was not a sufficient, I mean, it's, you shouldn't say it was not, it, it, 
it was not a sufficient incentive, but also the, the, the challenges of serving that population are, are really significant. Um, and so uh, there, there is, I guess, one way to answer it is there is some work out there that, that people have held out some incentives of things which are value, which I think are not cash, um, but we could probably learn something. And, and uh, there are some researchers um, affiliated with San Jose State who, who published a report on, on some of those courses. Yes. I think maybe just uh, a, right, a, yeah. a very quick reaction is that I think that would be an interesting research question. Uh, the cash flow is going in the opposite direction <laughs> in which we want, uh, so that's one thing to think about. I, I thanks all of you for your input tonight. Um, you know, so much of the allure of not just edX courses, but MOOCs in general, is the opportunity to learn with so many other people. Uh, yet I, I think for the majority of students, there's still a lot of you know learning alone together. And I'm just curious how this sort of data that you're getting might be able to be used in the future to increase you know collaboration amongst users, um, so that people really are learning more t uh, together in these environments. Yeah, there's all, there's all kinds of fascinating stuff about cohorting. Um, here's a oh, is this not on anymore? Um, can this go back on? Can I show one? Thing? We actually have a good slide here. Yes. Um, so this is some work that Tommy Mullaney, who's an undergraduate, is doing. It's a little bit complicated to explain, but briefly, like each dot, the size of the dot is um, well, the x-axis is the week relative to course start, um, and the y-axis is the different parts of the course, and the size of the dot represents how many people are jumping into a course at a particular time. Um, so you see that most people sort of follow along the general course flow, um, but there are other people who essentially start like later along in the, in the course flow. Um, and they're basically every week there are lots of people who show up into the introduction of the course in week one. Um, what if we could capture those people and somehow put them into cohorts? What if we could say, hey, you're a late arrival, um, but guess what, like you're a late arrival with a whole bunch of other people, and here's how we'll segment the forums to connect you and things like that. Um, yeah. David Malin's CF50 class is starting to experiment with that. I mean, the stuff that David is doing this semester, or this year, is so incredible. So his course runs from January 1st to December 31st because he views it essentially as open courseware with an auto grader rather than as a course. If you go on any given day, it'll give you a recommended set of deadlines that change from day to day. Um, so basically, if you start really early in the course, David and his team will recommend, well, here's a good time to do the first project and the second and the third. If you show up like December 25th, he's going to be like, you really ought to finish project one on the 26th and project two on the 27th <laughs> and project three on the 28th, which you would have no hope of doing in CS50 because it's really hard. Um, but uh, I think there's all kinds of ways to think about how we could experiment in putting people in different kinds of communities to, to support that sort of learning. And there's cool stuff edX is doing with meetups um, in physical locations and things like that. Also very, good, very much a concern of the people who are taking the courses, right? How do we, how do we connect with each other? Last question. Uh, hi, thank you for your presentation. I really appreciate it. And my question is, in the research of demographics, have you researched on how many of the registrants are uh, Harvard or MIT students? And would they prefer to take an online course if they have the chance to like go to a face-to-face -face session? So there's, there is work being done. Um, there are a number of professors who are using edX materials in their courses. Peter is one of them. Greg Nas is one of them. Uh, Peter Gallison are some of them. And I think we're starting to gather some survey data from them about what's their experience of the course. I don't think we're asking. Um, uh, uh, Terry Fisher did ask in his courses, uh, in his survey, whether or not people were Harvard alumni. Um, and so that's of interest. That might be an interesting thing. I mean, this is a great idea, which is why we do these things. It might be interesting in some of our pre-course surveys to say, all right, who here is actually already at Harvard? You know, what percentage of Harvard X students are already currently enrolled in Harvard um, and are just like doubling down on what they're doing? Um, that would be an interesting thing to, to explore and find out. Our sense, of course, is that, first of all, you know, you, don't, you can't get credit for a Harvard X course. Important to keep in mind, right? And so students have probably less incentive to take them because students want to graduate, and thus they want courses that offer credit. Um, that, that's our, our general sense. Thank you all very much. Thanks very much to Justin Wright. Thank you for coming on a snowy night, Dan and Bridget, um, and graduate. Hey, yeah, yeah. And I'm happy to stay and chat with anybody who wants to talk about anything. The bus will be slow no matter when I leave. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Bridget.
of stuff to get people to stick around more. Let's get them to stick around more. Thanks. Hey, it was great to see you. How's it going? Thanks for coming out. Most people up and saying, "Will you do an interview with us for an hour and tell us about your experience?" I mean, I don't think we're. I think I, I don't think for those kinds of things of how people. Make